Welcome. We are thrilled to have you joining Provisio Partners Human Services Innovation Webinar Series as a part of this year's Dreamforce to You. We are excited to be sharing this client success story, but more importantly, we want this webinar to be a resource for you to help you better understand how Salesforce and Provisio Partners can address your challenges and allow you to reach your goals. As a part of that, we are here to answer your questions. So we invite you to enter your questions throughout the webinar using the chat function located on the right-hand side of the screen. We will be answering questions in the chat during the presentation, and there will also be time at the end where our speakers will answer the questions live. So without further ado, let's kick things off. Hello, everybody. I'm Pete Ducharme from Provisio Partners. Really excited to have everybody here today for our Dreamforce to You event. This is the second of three webinars in our Provisio Partners Human Services Innovation Series. So looking forward to today's webinar and hope you learn uh, a little bit about Salesforce and nonprofit organizations. Really excited to have our client and partner on today talking about how they've utilized Salesforce to drive their mission and organization. Today, you're gonna to hear from Jared Pruitt, the Chief Operating Officer of Chinese American Service League, and Ping Jing Zhou, uh, the manager of the Center for Social Impact within Chinese American Service League. Um, I'll hand it over to Jared here shortly. Today, you're going to learn a little bit more about uh, Provisio Partners, about Salesforce, and about Chinese American Service League and how they've done a fantastic job of you know, serving the community and using technology to drive that forward. Um, we're going to talk about the why of why, we needed, why they needed that technology, as well as the what, how, and ultimately the impact that they're, that they're making and how they're measuring that. Thank you, Pete. Uh, so a little bit about the Chinese American Service League. Uh, Castle, as we're also known, has existed for over 40 years, serving the Chicago uh, community and actually beyond. Um, we are distinct in having um, over 19 different programs uh, under our umbrella. So this really makes us one of the most comprehensive social service providers uh, in the Midwest and the most comprehensive social service provider serving the Asian American Pacific Islander population in the entire Midwest. We serve uh, roughly over 5,000 families um, a year and annually, and we do so through uh, five different distinct kind of departments. The first is um, our children and youth development program, where we serve kids around eight months to 18 years of age through home visiting, uh, in addition to Head Start, early Head Start, uh, K through five after school programming, and then middle school and high school after school programming. Uh, with that, we also have a community and family well-being uh, department where we focus on um, kind of healthcare navigation. We do wellness programs. We also are a Department of Justice certified citizenship and immigration uh, center. Uh, within that, we also provide um, legal support uh, through our legal clinic. We also have one of the, the area's largest senior uh, services program where we do um, in-home support for seniors. We also have adult day service for seniors who are needing additional support during the day. And then finally, we have a employment and financial empowerment program where we um, will help uh, those in need find employment. We have a very specific culinary training uh, program that we offer, a 12-week program. And then we're also a HUD certified housing counseling organization where we help families deal with foreclosures, but also do a lot more of helping families to purchase uh, homes for first time home buyers, as well as uh, financial education. Thank you, Jared. Um, so a little bit about Provisio Partners. We are first and foremost, a human services consulting firm. We only work with human service organizations. So that really allows us to come in and really understand organizations and the challenges that they're facing and be able to dig in pretty quickly. Uh, the only technology that we work with is Salesforce. Um, and we, we pride ourselves in knowing the technology and understanding how to utilize that technology to drive an organization's mission. Um, at the end of the day, we're not successful until our clients are successful. So a couple of areas that I wanted to touch on today, we've partnered with over 95 clients and done over 160 projects in the last three years. Currently, our CSAT, our CSAT score is 4.68 out of five. 
and, and we're top 10 in ACV for all of Salesforce.org partners in 2020. Uh, so we've had a great year looking forward to continuing to support organizations and ultimately helping organizations drive their mission through technology. So to help um, you all to understand the journey that uh, Castle faced, we wanted to start with the answering the question of why, why Salesforce, why Previsio, why the need um, for us to transition. So uh, we, like many nonprofits in the nation, um, had faced um, very uh, decentralized um, siloed uh, programs where each program was kind of operating within its own data system. So um, for those on the call, you could probably understand that some programs have Excel, some programs may have COPA for early childhood, some programs have the HUD exchange, uh, where Castle had over 19 different uh, systems that were operating in 19 different programs. Um, what we faced was uh, duplication of data, uh, but also a lack of service coordination. And considering that 48% of those that are served at Castle are part of a family where they receive multiple services at Castle, um, lacking that ability to service, uh, provide service coordination, not just from a person-to-person, -person, from a technology standpoint, um, was a big hindrance that we were facing. The other thing, too, for us is that we were having difficulty being able to prove impact. We know anecdotally that for over 40 years, being the largest provider of services in Chicago for the API population, being the largest employer in Chinatown, we knew that we were having an impact, but it was all anecdotal. What we wanted to do was prove that we've had impact. So one of the things that we looked at uh, in terms of the what is phasing this project out, knowing that um, the scope of this project uh, is large enough to where we had to handle it in several different phases. So on this slide, you'll see kind of phase one for us is that we wanted to implement Bird's Eye, which is kind of our client relationship management system that Provisio uh, brought forth to us and installed. So the unique thing with Castle is that every program at Castle, every um, staff member and every client is on the same system. Um, so there are times where we will still need to utilize other systems as pure reporting tools. So for example, for our HUD exchange, we have to report um, our numbers for financial counseling, housing counseling on HUD exchange, but our single point of truth is Salesforce. And that is something that all of our staff are very clear and cognizant of. So reporting to other systems, although there are duplications at times, they use the other system simply to report up to funders um, as per the requirement of their contract. So phase one was to get all of our staff onto one system and then also give them dashboards as quickly as possible so that they could see the impact of the services that they could provide and see the value in the system that, um, that we were asking them to switch over to. Now you'll notice that there is a separate component called EVV or electronic verification visits. So we do um, in-home support for seniors where our worker will go out to the home and um, provide services at home. So that system is a bit unique where it's a fully mobile system. Um, it is the bird's eye platform, um, but it allows our uh, home care staff to clock in and clock out. It uses GPS verification to prove that they're actually in the home before they can clock. Once the services are provided and the case notes are done, the client then um, uses e-signature or finger signature to be able to sign and prove the services. That's a bit um, separate outside of the bird's eye realm because that's a very comprehensive system that has to do managed care uh, billing. And this is again all within phase one. We started this in January of 18. Um, 18 of the programs were completed by uh, roughly June of 18. And then the EVV system uh, took a bit longer because of its mobility. And so we finished that in May of 2019. So following the implementation of phase one, we went into phase two, which is um, where we are currently nearing the end of. And this is where we've added in things like GeoPoint, uh, as well as Einstein Analytics. We had Einstein in the first phase, but really we were only using it for basic demographic data. And now we're actually using the full power of Einstein to compare our, our data with external data um, as well. 
And in addition to that, we've added a couple other partners in like Saved Intact and Kalocity who have um, integrations with the Salesforce platform that allow us to do um, P&L integration as well as um, streamline our managed care billing process. And then phase three. So this is what we're looking at for 2021 is the areas in red, um, which is the experience cloud, uh, which we are going to kind of put the, the power of the CRM and Salesforce in the hands of our clients and our funders. So from our client's perspective, um, through data, we discovered that uh, the ages between 23 and 43 uh, years of age um, were were less likely to be served by Castle. So we were serving kids, we were serving seniors, but we noticed a dip in kind of that center population. And so when we looked at the data, we found that a lot of those folks are working um, during the hours of Castle, uh, but the issue is, is that they're working in um, retail or restaurant industry with minimum wage jobs. Um, and so they still needed our services, but were unable to come in. So the next phase for us is to use Experience Cloud to give our clients direct access to their caseworkers as well as their files to be able to upload um, new data, uh, new information, update their records. And then on the other side of things, giving our funders direct access to, um, to Einstein and to our data so that for a funder example, is that they're funding our culinary training program, which we track placement as well as 30, 60, 90, 180, and two year um, uh, job retainment. Uh, we want our funders who fund that program to be able to see the data live in Einstein, which is de identified, of course. And then it gives them the experience um, to where uh, it opens up our form of communication and partnership between us and our funder to be able to have more substantial information or more substantial discussions with them. Uh, to look at trends, to look at how we can shift with them, um, and also to have them see data for what it really is, kind of the, the single source of truth. So we want to be more transparent with our funders in that process. So that is where we are heading as an organization. And as I always say uh, to our staff that this is a very iterative process um, where kind of like the iPhone version 12, we're on kind of that Salesforce version three, if you will, but there are more and more versions to come um, as we progress in this experience. So the how. Um, so I always tell, um, when I'm speaking to other organizations about how we've implemented this program, I always tell our um, partners that the technology is easy, although I should say it's easier, and the workforce culture change is, is difficult. Um, so a couple of things that we work with Previsio on um, to help kind of correct that. Um, so the first component is, and something that, that we want to be very realistic on, is that for phase one, this is something that um, Castle funded on our own. It was an investment that the leadership as well as the board was willing to make to propel us into kind of the 21st century. Um, and this allowed us to be able to then show proof of concept for phase two and phase three and then to be able to go out to funders and be able to fund um, those future uh, phases, which has been a very successful model for us. The other thing is that we, as you can see, take this initiative step-by-step, step, phase one, phase two, phase three, we're very calculated in what steps that we take next. And uh, we ensure that we always have capacity to move into the next phase before we jump into that. The other thing is in terms of utilization. So Castle maintains a 97% daily utilization rate um, among our staff. And the 3% that don't are typically myself or maybe more of an administrator who doesn't necessarily log in every single day. So our staff are using this. Um, when we went into uh, the pandemic and we had to go remote, um, we developed reports where we could see on a daily basis the interactions our staff were having with the clients through their case notes and through record logs. So looking at the utilization, one is, is that we wanted to, although this was kind of a, a top-down decision, we wanted the development of this to be bottom up. So Provisio worked with our direct care staff and our quality assurance staff to really develop the system. It was not executive led. And the reason being is that we wanted our staff to really have a say in 
um, what this system looks like, how it interacts with them, but also because they, as they develop this single point of truth, uh, because they work directly with the clients, they have a greater truth than what myself or our CEO does. Um, the other thing is we developed internal team ambassadors through our quality assurance program, but this is also why it was so important to get dashboards um, active as quickly as we possibly uh, could. Uh, in terms of shaping the culture, again, as I talked about top-down um, buy-in, but also bottom-up uh, led in terms of the ownership, um, Salesforce, um, our bird's eye system, and um, using data as the database informed practice and single point of truth is something that we use repetitively in the language. So in our quarterly staff meetings, in our supervisions, uh, in job descriptions, uh, Salesforce is an embedded into everything that we do um, and it is reinforced on a daily basis uh, with our staff. And then again, as I talked about, getting the dashboard in the hands of the staff as quickly as possible um, is a fundamental um, component and buying into our 97% utilization rate. All right, let me share my screen here. So can everyone see my screen? Okay, so you're seeing here right now is a um, program dashboard is for our culinary training program. So that's the program that we uh, train students culinary skills and then help them place uh, find placements in culinary industry. Um, right here we have um, the number of participants and their graduation rate, and also the rate that graduates find jobs. And also we can see what kind of jobs, like full-time position or part-time position that they have. Um, and then also their wage situation. So in here, we can have a view of the wage translated to annual income, and then we can compare with the income that um, for those clients prior to our program. So that right here, you can see a impact in terms of the dollar amount uh, of our program that I had to this client. Isn't that great? Um, the second dashboard I want to show is the um, housing dashboard. So this is our program, it's called Housing and Financial Education. Um, right here, we have some service numbers, but I would like you to look in the middle here um, here is a perfect example of how we tell the story of um, program impact from output to short-term income, uh, short-term outcome, and long-term outcome. So here we have number of clients who were enrolled in this home buyer education workshop, which is output service number, and then we have their pre and post test results to show the short-term outcome, um, indicating the knowledge gain. And also we have the breakdowns of each participants to show their knowledge gain. And then we also track um, those clients' credit score over time so that it's indication of a behavior change, which is long-term results. Um, so as you can see, most of our clients have had uh, made big improvements in their credit score, some by uh, quite a bit. So um, funders actually really like those kind of stories we actually have had one founder voluntarily increase their funding support to us without even being asked to just after we show them this dashboard. So this is um, how powerful it is. Um, the third screen that I would like to share is this map. Um, so this is one of the, um, our favorite apps that we use in Salesforce. Um, it allows you to present um, any geo data on a map visually. Um, it also allows you to import data from um, outside data source. So like what I have here is the Chicago community area. Um, let me enable um, this map layer of our castle active clients for FY19 and then also the FY20. I use a different color thing here. Um, the red one represents um, clients in FY19, and then the color blue represent uh, FY20. So each of the pane represent one client or household. Um, so right here, you can see most of our clients are within Chicago area, but there are quite some uh, that are outside of Chicago as well. <clears throat> so here is just a simple like client data. Um, I can dissect the data um, by program, by department or group separate program together if they were funded by 
the same founder. So the main benefits of this tool is um, for application reporting. I know a lot of times a uh, founder will ask, um, where, where are your lo clients located? And preferably break them down by community areas. So right here, I have the community area map. So it makes my job so much easier to count those numbers in each community area. Um, the other thing about this map is, like Jerry has mentioned, um, right now we only have two years of data. Of course, um, I wouldn't call it a trend, but imagine three years, five years down the road, we will be able to see if there's a pattern of our client's migration, whether we should, then we can um, decide whether we wanted to move our office location or set up a satellite office to provide services to better meet the clients where they are. So that, that is the main value of this tool. Um, and then the next, the last one is um, the Einstein Analytics, uh, which is a visualization tool that Salesforce offers. It does not only provide more powerful data visualization features than the regular dashboard that I just showed you earlier, um, but also it can accept data from the sources outside of our own Salesforce environment. Uh, this key feature makes it an ideal tool for us to do data comparison. So right here, you can see on the left side of the screen are the data from our Castle clients, which is directly from our Salesforce system. And then on the right-hand side is the data that we have imported from a open source the data reservoir called Chicago Health Atlas, where the um, city of Chicago has published um, data related to social determinant health on all the Chicago residents. So this is part of our um, so-called SUH project, which I won't go into detail here. Um, but right here, right now, I'm simply showing you the capability of the system. So you can see we can put the two sets of data side by side, and it's easier to see um, where our clients are and then comparatively uh, compared to the general population in Chicago um, in terms of their education level, employment status, household income. So in this way, um, it allows us to better understand and our clients in the perspective of, you know, um, kind of a, the general population in Chicago. So we know where the barriers are and then understand and then to devise um, solutions to close those barriers or those gaps. So that's, um, that concludes the demo here. Um, now I'm gonna turn it back to Jared. Thank you, Ping Jing. So let's talk about the impact that this has had um, on, on the Chinese American service, like um, not just with Salesforce, but our partnership with uh, Provisio. So I thought I'd start out with, um, for those executives in the room talking about kind of revenue and expenses and how this has kind of reshaped our organization. Um, so in terms of revenue, we have actually seen since the implementation of Salesforce, a 200% increase in our um, corporate and foundation grants uh, program. Um, and that is directly related to our ability to um, uh, create um, and demonstrate our impact um, and our data informed practice with our funders. Um, as Ping Jin had um, briefly talked about being able to show our dashboards to our funders live um, either via video or prior to that in person um, has been um, a transformative uh, process for the, for us. And we've seen more and more of our, our corporate foundation partners coming to us and saying, um, how much additional money do you need um, in addition to the program dollars we give to you to be able to support this um, program, this data informed practice that you guys have moved into. Um, and then the exciting part is our fiscal year 21, our fiscal years are July to June. We're actually looking to double that um, revenue again this year. So we're already hit our target and today is, um, uh, you know, middle of December. Um, so we're well on our way to doubling our grants revenue again this year. Uh, the other thing is from a federal perspective, um, we were able to secure our first direct federal grant um, on the strength of our ability to uh, provide evidence. Uh, so let me clarify that. So we were one of nine awardees nationwide for a um, Alzheimer's and dementia 
um, service provision and research-based uh, grant. Uh, seven of the awardees were uh, state agencies and two were actually nonprofits. Um, and the strength of our proposal came in um, in our ability to not just um, provide, but um, evaluate uh, the data uh, from our services that are all fed through, uh, through Salesforce and Einstein. And so we've seen that have a direct uh, implication. And that, you know, as we all know, federal grants are multi-year and um, most times are going to be high six or seven figure uh, grants. Uh, from an expense, expense standpoint, we utilize um, utilization reports. So whenever we have a program position open up, we look at utilization rates and make the determination on whether or not we need to fill that position based off of active caseloads. So what that has done is um, over uh, the past 18 months when we first started uh, this, this implementation, we were able to um, not fill a number of positions based on utilization rates. And what we did is we passed those salaries on to um, the remaining staff and we were able to bring 100% of our staff up to market rate uh, within an 18 month period. And to put that into perspective, we have 535 staff. Um, so that was a significant undertaking, but we were able to do that without impacting our budget overall. The other thing is that we were able to start the Center for Social Impact um, in March of um, 2020 uh, during kind of the start of the pandemic. And um, that, that center is already 85% funded uh, because of the strength of what we're able to show our corporate foundation supporters, our individual donors. And then as an organization, we've been able to end the past three fiscal years with a surplus, including uh, last year, um, last fiscal year, which ended on June 30th, uh, which many organizations have been impacted by COVID, but we were actually able to um, end the year with a uh, slight surplus using data to look at utilization levels, but also because of increased uh, funding you know, in philanthropy and um, federal uh, grants. In regards to staff and board engagement, um, let me give you kind of an example of staff engagement. We talked about dashboard. So our K through five, our kindergarten through five after school program, we have three classrooms in that program. And we looked at um, participation rates of our children. And the direct care staff noticed that in one classroom, the teacher had uh, about a 98% participation level when it came to math and reading concepts. So looking at the data, the teachers gathered together along with Beijing kind of asked the question, why are your kids um, participating in lessons whereas the other classrooms are having between you know, a 65 and 75% participation rate? And so the teacher talked about how she would use cooking um, as a way to go over ingredients, um, how to read a, um, uh, an ingredients list, how to measure, how to use math concepts, and so the other two classrooms decided to implement the same process and saw that their participation rate had went up to high 90s from that. And so that's an example of where actually our direct care staff looked at their own data and their own results and as a group decided to pivot the other two classrooms around that data to bring up participation rates of our children. From the board and leadership perspective, um, we use our CRM um, as well as Einstein in our uh, board committee meetings um, where we can help um, further conversations so rather than create reports on paper, we're able to show in our boardroom on the screen um, the live versions going to show them the dashboards that Ping Jing just showed you. Um, also using Einstein to do comparative analysis on social determinants of health, looking at the um, real needs of our communities versus what we believe to be the needs. Um, so from that, we have seen um, our board recruitment has changed significantly. So we had a board of 15, we now have a board of 25. Um, over the past year, we have vetted 32 board prospects. Um, and the number of board prospects and quality of board prospects that are coming in is um, far different than before. For now, we have C-suite and executive VP level um, board members wanting to come in. And part of the process is during recruitment, we actually show them um, Salesforce and we walk them through what you've just seen um, live. And um, the power that has brought in board members um, because of the strength of being able to show and pivot around data. 
And because of that, our program committee has increased its size by 400%. We've added a couple of medical doctors and evaluators. Um, we have a PhD as well that has joined our program committee um, because of the strength of the data and being able to pivot around data-informed practice. Uh, remote work. Um, so when um, when executive order uh, from the state was passed out on March 17th, Castle was very easily able to pivot to remote work because we had the infrastructure already in place. Um, we made sure that our staff had laptops and VPN access, of course, but the power of Salesforce was already there. And um, the unique thing is that we were able to track on a daily basis the engagement levels of our clients. We were able to look at calendar heat maps compared to last year versus this year. And we looked at um, what we saw was a skyrocket in, in client engagement um, when the kind of state shut down, if you will, um, and looking at the calls coming in, the needs that were being um, met. And um, so from that, we saw an 8% increase in, in our client uh, caseload from FY20 compared to FY19. And all that tracked in real time, the managers of each departments received um, a weekly email that was generated from the system that showed utilization rates, showed links to case notes so that they can investigate and dive in deeper uh, if they needed to and have those conversations with our direct care staff in their supervision around how they engage their clients. Our, as I talked about evaluation, um, because we're able to evaluate our project, um, we will also receive the federal grant as I talked about in regards to our Alzheimer's project. We also are in partnership with Northwestern University um, and the National Institute of Health around cancer navigation, which we are tracking in Salesforce um, as well. And then in regards to strategic planning, um, so we just finalized our three-year strategic plan in December of 19. And when we present to the board, we actually used the Salesforce system to show them um, our impact we were having and not having. We were able to use GeoPoint to, to see where our clients live and where we need to look at future growth for an organization. Uh, and so from that, we have a very comprehensive three-year strategic plan that is actually based off of real data that came from um, both our CRM bird's eye as well as from um, Einstein Analytics. Okay, so last but not the least, um, Castle Center for Social Impact was launched, like Jerry mentioned, in March this year, um, where we function as a innovation engine at Castle. We promote and support program innovation and improvements, uh, mainly through like two main avenues. One leveraging cutting edge technology, Salesforce, um, to collect, analyze, and um, provide real-time feedback to programs for uh, programs to make informed decision-making. Um, two, we conduct extensive research to make sure to keep us at the forefront of best practices um, in terms of program assessments and evaluation methods. And then we select, recommend, and support implementation of those validated assessment tools for programs. Um, in addition to support existing programs, we also conduct community level research, um, such as the SDOH project that uh, we have mentioned before, um, that allows us to better understand and identify um, potential community needs, um, provide information for future program planning and strategic planning. Um, so as the manager of the Center for Social Impact, I would like to share a few achievements that we have had um, just within this less than a year time frame. Uh, first of all, like Jerry mentioned, um, our, funder, our center was funded 85% um, already in year one. So thanks to um, the Castle leadership and our generous founders and, and supporters. Um, second achievement is that we were able to create um, dashboards for every single programs, um, dashboards that are similar to the ones that I shared before um, to provide information, real-time feedback for programs to make um, decisions. The third achievement um, is during the COVID um, pandemic. Like Jerry has mentioned before, we had to move most of our services online, um, which thanks to Salesforce is a cloud-based system. So we didn't have to move our data from our server user USB, or worse yet, move the physical file from the office to home. So that 
allows us to make a seamless transition. And also we were able to create daily reports to make sure uh, information are shared and communicate, teams are communicating in an effective and efficient manner. Um, the last one, um, during the pandemic, um, I think a lot of times when you apply for funding, especially now when you apply for funding, especially if it's COVID related funding, um, one of the most common question is, what is the impact or, uh, of COVID-19 to your program service delivery? Um, for us, for me, um, it's very easy to run a report to just from March 17th when we went remote um, to now and then compare the data with the same time frame of last year, 2019. Um, as a matter of fact, I just run this report a few days ago uh, for one of our programs within 10 minutes. That's how easy and powerful the system is. Um, so the last, um, I would like to um, tell you a little bit about our um, community research project. So first is the SDOH um, project that we are very proud of and um, have conducted in the summer of this year. So I provided a link here in this PowerPoint, which we can um, definitely send it to you guys uh, after this presentation. And in, in the report, we um, have details um, of the project uh, purposes and the methodology that we use and the main findings. So if you like to read, um, I will highly recommend it. Um, and then feel free to download it and share and distribute. And better yet, if you wanted to collaborate with us, please let me know. And then the second is the QL project quality of life, um, which we have finished the data collection period just last week. Uh, we're currently working on the narrative report and data and, and analysis. So stay tuned. Okay. So I wanted to talk about the uh, partnership aspect because um, we believe that our partnership with uh, Provisio um, has really led to a lot of our successes because the system was not built in a vacuum. Um, the system was built with a, an amazing partner, uh, Provisio Partners, um, and really truly in partnership with them. Um, we don't see Provisio Partners as a, um, as a data provider or a, a app provider or a system provider. Um, this is an interactive process with them. It's been an iterative process with them. It's been a learning process as well. So a couple of things why this partnership has been so successful is um, Provisio Partners has always been very clear from the start that their, their mission is um, to really make a change, a societal change um, in, in the nonprofit human services sector. And because of that focus, um, they've really remained um, kind of laser-like focus. And also throughout the last three years have gained a really great understanding of human services. Um, everywhere from citizenship to employment to um, legal uh, services. They really have an enormous amount of human service understanding, which is really key to creating a good data system or creating good platforms, having that baseline understanding. I think the other component is that, um, you know, Provisio being local um, was a, a good uh, kind of component for us, but they also now have um, other folks located with throughout the nation. Um, and I think the important component is that Provisio has always been very responsive and very, very reliable. Um, so if there is a need, we can pick up the phone and call them um, and they'll help us work through it. Or if we need some advice or to look at the next stage or the next strategy, they're always there to talk with us through, um, through the process. Yeah, and, and greatly appreciate that, Jared. And obviously, you know, we've learned a lot along the way here as well. Um, you know, for us, it's really about our, our core values are around gratitude and transparency. So we look at it as, you know, we're going to be very transparent about what we can do, what we can't do, um, how we can partner on that and really work together. Because as you know, uh, these, you know, these efforts and this over undertaking of you know, taking on the systems and putting all this information into one place and then making sense of it. It is, a, it's a, it's a journey to do that. Um, there's a lot that goes into it and 
you know, we can't do that unless we have the right partner that is driving that from the client side as well. So, um, you know, you guys are fantastic and have done a great job of adopting and, and really driving it from the top down um, that this is, this is the vision and this is how the organization is going to be run. So that's, that certainly helped out a lot. Um, but we're continuous, continuing to learn together. Um, and really, ultimately, we want to be able to, you know, show that we're helping organizations and helping you make the biggest impact that you can. Thank yeah, you. I have a, oh, sorry. I have had a work with Provisio on several different projects, and every time it's very a uh, pleasant experience. Um, I feel like I learn a lot with different teams um, of Provisio. All of the Provisio teams, every everybody's very professional and very um, supportive. And I feel like throughout the process, uh, me and my team has learned a lot. And also we feel like we can re always rely on them. And they have been really, really responsive to all the requests, including the weekends. Uh, we have a couple of times like Salesforce has an update over the weekend, uh, which uh, we outreach to them and they responded and solved the problem within 15 minutes. So yeah. that's something that you, know, you cannot say that for every partner you have. Thanks, Bing Jing. So I think the other component too is, is that um, when we engaged Provisio, we knew that this would not be a one-time um, kind of build our system and then and walk away. This has been an iterative process. So it being that um, we needed a multi-year uh, partnership with them and they've been great in kind of helping us to build this system and um, move it in a way that actually has surpassed our own expectations. Um, this is bigger and better than what we had ever imagined it would become and has um, created such an enormous impact on our organization far beyond what we ever thought it would. Um, and so that's really been an important component is kind of engaging them on a, on a multi-year, um, long-term uh, kind of engagement strategy. And I think for the final component is that for Visio, I remember when we first engaged for Visio, um, the first 30 days, they really met with our staff, um, got to know the programs, um, one program at a time, each and every program, um, getting to know all the documents that they needed to integrate into the system, um, had at that time face-to-face -face meetings um, with all of our direct care staff. And so it, they really showed that, that drive and that um, willingness to want to get to know who we are and what we do. Um, which really had helped to shape what the system kind of looks like. And I think that um, rather than coming to us and saying, here's a can system that we're going to give to you and you need to uh, pivot to Provisio's needs, Provisio came and said, we're going to build this around what your needs are. And that has helped with utilization rates. That is what has been um, a key driver to our success. Yeah, and, and again, thank you for that, Jaron. You guys have been a great partner. Um, I know you mentioned a little bit earlier about you know us being local and being able to work with your team. Obviously, this year has um, has changed a lot for everybody. Um, you know, we still value that that one on one and that time with the client, so that we're able to really dive into you know what's trying to be accomplished here and how we can do that. Um, so over this last year, obviously with the pandemic and everything going on, um, we were pretty, we were able to shift into a virtual model pretty quickly because, you know, before that most, the majority of our projects were across the U.S. Um, it's always great when we have local clients and we can, when we can meet with them and looking forward to hopefully doing that again here in the future. But um, we've been delivering nationwide projects over the last year. Um, and have been able to do that from, you know, beginning to end and, and continuing to support. Um, one of the big areas that I know Jared and Ping Jing mentioned is that ongoing relationship um, and, you know, really looking at how we can enable you to better utilize the system that you have. And there's that ongoing training and mentoring that we offer as well uh, to our clients. And it's also, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a true partnership of a back and forth and really understanding um, you know, how we can learn from you and, and take that feedback as far as, you know, what you're seeing on your end and how we can, you know, bring that back internally, make things better and, and roll that back out and, and to potentially other clients as well. So um, have 
really appreciated the, the partnership that we have. With and I think you bring up a really important component that isn't on this slide is that one of the things that Castle's always wanted to do was uh, increase our internal bandwidth or our internal capacity. So uh, Ping Jing is the certified Salesforce administrator. Um, and then we just added our second um, certified Salesforce administrator, our data analyst, Dan, who actually both came from Castle. So we're trained up within Castle. And one of the things that we are sure to do when we engage Provisio in phases is we make sure we build in that training component. So Provisio has done an amazing job at, um, at kind of training uh, Ping Jing, especially when it came to the Einstein component. Um, and Dan, so that we can continue to build our internal capacity so that um, we don't always have to call Provisio for internal issues that could be very easily fixed internally. We reach out to Provisio from a more strategic fashion on some of the bigger things, the project um, things that need to move forward on. Absolutely. You know, hopefully everybody's been able to learn a lot from this. I think it's been fantastic and really appreciate uh, Jared and Ping Jing taking the time to share their story and their journey and talk about, you know, how things have gone and, and where things continue to go. So uh, looking forward to, to further conversations and any questions that anybody might have. All right. Thank you so much, Jared and Ping Jing. Um, as always, you're a great partner, great conversation today, and uh, I love hearing all about your Salesforce journey and, and the impact that you're making. Um, I want to take take a moment to take a little bit of time here. I know that we've had some questions come in in chat, so let's take a look at those as well. Um, I know a few of them have been answered by our Provisio partner teammates, but I want to make sure we go through them. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the Bird's Eye platform, Robert? I know that was early on, and then we covered it um in that demonstration and, and travis gave you a little bit of a, a a summary there so hopefully that that answers your question um i know pam had a question of capturing photos with the date uh, location date stamp erica had answered that question but um i wanted ping jing to talk a little bit about their uh, EV, evv solution and how they're utilizing that uh that location date stamp yeah, sure. Thanks, Pete. Um, yes, like Eric has pointed out, we um, use the GPS location uh, functionality attached with the EVV um, kind of like sp special development from for, from Provisio. Um, the only things that we do not really capture the photo um, with a ta uh, timestamp and location um, I think it could be done. Um, of course, like Provisio probably will have uh, solutions for that. Um, just for in, for our case, we don't really need the photo to be attached. Um, but I do know like Salesforce does have the functionality that you can upload and um, your client's photo and then to be um, either printed out on a info sheet or just existing in the system as a part of yeah. the client profile. Exactly. Um, thanks, Ping Jing. And really, it comes down to the, the individual's use case for us to be able to go in there, understand what you're really trying to capture and what needs to be done. Uh, and then we go back and build that solution. But those capabilities are um, within Salesforce and we can build those. Um, so I saw that Justin said he liked the, uh, the most important number is the biggest on the screen. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I made a comment there, Justin, you know, anything that you're putting into uh, Salesforce can be reported on and those individual dashboards can be modified for what's, you know, what's important and what's being measured within your organization. So thank you for your comment there. Um, I wanted to jump down to uh, Robert's other question. I know that, um, well, Anne, I'll, I'll skip one here. Anne had a question for Castle. Have you had any pushback from your board on the cost for Salesforce implementation? Jared, I'll let you take that one. Sure, uh, great question, Anne. I'm sure that that is on the minds of, of many when they uh, jump down to this, uh, this path. Um, as I had said, the initial investment was capital that Castle put forward. And then following that in phase two, and then hopefully in the subsequent phase three, um, the, uh, the philanthropic community saw the value in this 
and have funded those additional phases. But for that phase one, I wouldn't say there was pushback. I think there was a lot of questions from our board. And it's important, um, I think, for, for you, as it was for us, to really talk about the value of moving over to not just data informed practice, but especially if you have multiple programs, putting all of your programs under one system to be able to help clients in a more comprehensive and holistic uh, perspective. The other thing is that once our board started seeing the data, the dashboards, the GeoPoint, the Einstein, um, especially at the program committee level, they understood where the investment uh, was at. Um, so I think that um, from that perspective, uh, a, a little bit of questions, but I, I wouldn't say pushback, really, um, just kind of venturing. We also made it clear that, you know, with with the changing of um, wealth going from uh, kind of baby boomers to millennials, we know that millennials in philanthropy um, are less agency loyal. Um, they are brand loyal in terms of the issue. But if an agency is, let's say you've got two agencies in child welfare, if an agency that they're supporting isn't able to demonstrate impact, millennials are more likely to abandon that agency and move to the next one that can demonstrate impact. So looking at the um, research and looking at the future, um, that made sense to, sense to our board, financial sense. So that was also a driver. Great. Thank you, Jared. Um, and we have a couple more questions that are probably geared towards uh, Castle. Um, Lane asked, what is the biggest challenge for Castle so far in the Salesforce implementation process? Um, I think that, um, I think one of the biggest, uh, two, two answers here. The first one is I think the biggest challenge that a lot of organizations face, and that is around utilization, implementation. And that is where I think how we approached it was from kind of the bottom up where Previsio worked directly with our direct care staff to design and build the, the screens, the layouts that they would directly interface with, I think that was absolutely key in our ability to implement um, and have a 97% daily utilization rate. So I think that when I, when I uh, talk to uh, different agencies about considering Salesforce, I always tell them it's kind of 25% technology and 75% workplace culture. So if you don't have the buy-in at the top about implementing, but then the full buy-in from the bottom about how to implement, um, that's where we you would end up with um, more difficult time uh, around this. I think the biggest challenge for us in implementation was making sure that because we could see kind of that light at the end of the tunnel, we wanted to um, drive faster, 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 but we always stuck to phasing things in the appropriate way. So not to moving into phase two until phase one was complete and not going into phase three until phase two was complete, because we know that as we build the foundation, we want that next layer to be solid before we jump to the next layer above that. Got it. Thanks, Jared. Um, and we do have one last question here. Uh, could you give some advice for an organization considering implementing Salesforce? Um, I'll, I'll let you take that one, Jared, and then I'll, I'll throw in some of my thoughts as well. Um, so I think a couple things is, um, one is that this is for at least us, this was far more than just building a database. Uh, Salesforce is how we communicate. It is how we do business. Um, it is how we shaped our, our increased board size. It's how we shape our philanthropy. Um, and even for some ways that we don't use Salesforce yet, um, us using it from a programmatic perspective still shapes how we move forward. A great example is when I cited that um, our strategic plan for 2020 to 2023 was shaped by the data that we pulled from Salesforce. It was shaped by geo point looking at where our clients live where we place new satellite offices um so i think that for us looking at this as a pivot to data informed practice as an agency culture uh versus making it about a uh, a data system or a data warehouse or collecting data for data's sake um the other thing was making it clear to our staff that we wanted to create a learning environment for them where they could learn in real time uh, based off of how they provided services and then give them the power to pivot based off of the data that um, they collected and that they were showing. So really giving power to the staff 
by educating them and um, really asking them to be innovative, uh, which has been a really big cultural shift for us as an organization. Great, thank you. Um, and, and the other thing that I'll add there, I mean, when Jared's talking about a strategic plan, obviously over, you know, over a period of time, it's never too early to start looking at, you know, what that implementation might look like or what that transition may look like. So um, even if even if you're considering in the next year, in the next two years, transitioning to Salesforce, um, you know, we're, we want to be involved in those conversations early on to make sure that you have a good understanding of what that effort is going to take and, and what that transition is going to look like. So, um, you know, my advice is that it's never too early to start the conversations. Um, all right. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have today. Again, Jared and Pingjing, thank you so much for your time and your kind words. Um, it's always appreciated. I just want to remind everybody that this is the second in uh, three webinars that we have, the third one being tomorrow, I think, believe at noon central in the Provisio Partners Human Services Innovation Series. So looking forward to hearing from everybody and, and getting that feedback. And if you have any additional questions beyond this, feel free to reach out to us directly, whether that's through our website or on LinkedIn. And looking forward to connecting with you all. So everybody have a great week and I look forward to talking.